How are we doing, One Church? You guys doing all right? Man, it's good to see you. The house is packed today. I love it. Um, we have a special service for you. It's going to be an incredible day. I think you're, you're going to love it. Um, but I'd like to start by saying to all the new folks and faces that I see today, thank you for coming. It's great to have you. I hope you love it here. And uh, let's do something. Everybody that's joining us online all over the world, let them know how much you love them. It's great to have you as well. We love you. So I um, wanted to say that watching you serve yesterday was amazing and seeing this house built was just like, I love this church. You guys are amazing getting to see um, uh, this, this house. We're now gonna rent it out and we're gonna start Airbnb business. And so we're excited. We put the air in Airbnb, thank you. That's my joke for the day. That was such a bad joke. It was a dad joke if I've ever heard one. Anyways, um, we, I do have something I wanna talk to you about that's really been heavy on my heart this week. Uh, somebody in our church that's um, an absolutely beautiful, beautiful man uh, was in a really bad accident. I don't know if Brian and Jen, are you guys here today? I don't know if they're here. So Brian Kaiser runs a ministry called God's Eyes. And God's Eyes, he just wrote, wrote a book. He travels and gives glasses to people. And he's one of our missionaries that we support. And he's been a massive part of this church. He was actually called by God in this church, sitting in the gym while Greg was preaching, uh, which is beautiful. Um, and so he was in a really bad car accident on 74 in Crosstown. And it was a life-threatening, horrible uh, car crash. And Woody Battaglia was in the passenger seat and Brian was driving. And um, it was not their fault, but Woody was life flighted to Grady. And we were there moments afterwards and we're with his family this week. And so I just wanted to start because um, they're both lucky to be alive. Um, it, was a, it was a miracle that they're alive at all. And so we've been flooded with people praying and people concerned. And so would you guys mind starting today's service by praying for them and their families? Is that okay? Yeah, let's, let's pray. Father, we lift up Woody in the name of Jesus. We pray for healing on his body right now. We know, God, that um, he is fighting for his life and that he you know, has broken his, his neck and his back and ribs, and there, there's a lot in his face. And God, you know everything that's happened in his body. So we pray in the name of Jesus for healing. Make him whole. Uh, we also lift up um, Brian to, to make him whole as well. He's bruised and beaten up and hurting also. But we also pray for his emotional and spiritual health. We pray, Father, for his mind, that you would um, remove any shame in the name of Jesus and that he would have peace that passes understanding and that, God, you would be with both of them and their families as they heal through this horrible accident. So, God, we thank you that they are alive. We thank you for keeping them safe and we pray, Father, that you'll continue to do that in the name and the power of Jesus. Everybody said Amen, amen. And that's what church is all about. So um, today, our service is about honoring our heritage. We wanna take a second and, and look back. Our heart is that we would remember all that God has done in and through this church body, but also through men and women of faith that have done amazing things for the kingdom of God through this house. Um, I believe that we're all standing on the shoulders of great men and women that came before us. And what's happening here at this church right now is a miracle. I feel like I'm getting to reap a harvest of seeds that people planted years ago. And so there's this beautiful growth that's happening in this body because of the faithfulness of people that came before us. And so today I get to have the privilege to have our founding pastor, Greg Marksberry, he's in the house, and Doug Fultz, or they're gonna come up, I'm gonna do an interview with the two of them. There's only been four lead pastors, um, and one of them's name was Shane Hargrave. He was here for two years. And Shane, if you're watching online, we love you. And we can't thank you enough for the faithfulness that you gave to this body and the people you baptized and discipled. I'm grateful for you. And so today, we just wanna take a second and remember previous staff, elders, 
and honor what, what God's done through the uh, history of this church. So um, it fits perfectly to me uh, in this series called Revival. And it's because um, revival is about restoration. It's about uh, revitalizing. Um, and, and so th- this church is an incredible story of redemption. It's a comeback story. And it's a story of uh, restoration. And God has done an amazing thing to, to breathe life into something that had become stale and old. And God, God's done an amazing work here. And so my prayer during this series has been that each of us would have an individual uh, renewed passion for the Father, that our intimacy would be restored and that old things would be made new and beautiful um, for each of us. Revival always starts individually, by the way. It's always like, I'm, I'm the house of God, right? It's gotta start in my house. And then, then it helps the collective house, the body, uh, all be revitalized together. And so um, that's what God loves to do. Does anybody believe that we serve a God that loves to revitalize creation? Yes. He loves to make old things new and beautiful. That's, that's uh, what we, we, we get to serve a God that in the eyes of God, nothing and no one is too far gone. And so praise God for his grace and uh, for the way that he restores, because here's what I believe and here's what I'm standing on. The power and presence of God changes everything. And so when he shows up, man, all bets are off. Everything changes. Everything's different. Uh, Yesterday, we we got to build two houses, and it was a beautiful picture of the body of Christ being the body of Christ, where we built two houses and we're giving them away. Who does that? That's crazy, right? And so we had built two houses, one of them was sent away by noon yesterday. So if you weren't here, what did you do by noon yesterday? Because we, we built two houses, whatever. And so um, I thought that was a beautiful picture of what it looks like to say, hey, we wanna bless the earth. We wanna be people that uh, speak life and make things more beautiful. And so uh, this girl, Marcia, was one of the people that's receiving one of those houses. And I, I think she's here. Marcia, are you here? I don't know if she, she said she was gonna come. She lied. <laughs> Marcia, if you're watching online, it's great to have you. You're not a liar, I'm just kidding. So she, she said to me, she said, I, I, I can't tell you how much I feel the presence of God here. And she said, my heart's just so full. And she was just, tears were dropping off of her face. And we just keep kind of hearing that over and over. And it's because the power of God is alive in all you jokers. And, and the spirit's so present in your lives. The way you love people is not normal. And so um, there is revival that's happening in, in this house. And so that's what revival is about. Re- revivals change the trajectory of where things are headed. And it, it's not just in people, but it's actually in cities and in nations. The trajectory is changed. It happens when one person confesses their sins and we do a 180 turnaround. And when one person does that, it it catches on, right? John Wesley, during one of the Great Awakenings, said, if you catch yourself on fire, people will come to watch you burn. And I feel like that's what's happening. It's like there's this, this turn, and revivals don't only change one person, they change, they change the, the hearts of a group of people. And so that's what happened during both um, the Great Awakenings, uh, during the Welsh Revival, the Brownsville Revival, the Jesus Movement, because revivals, they, the, the power of God has no limitations. And once it's released on the earth, man, God, God completely transforms thousands of people for eternity. And so um, it's easy for us to forget that, right? Great, great revivals can be lost in the analogs of time and they, they can be forgotten about. So it's important to go, hey, let's remember this. Let's talk about it. Let's look back and remember our history. We have to take time to honor our heritage to the, actually what made us who we are and what we're becoming. And so we, we all know that if we don't learn from our past, then history will just repeat itself, right? 
You guys have heard that. Unfortunately, we stink at this. And the people of God throughout history have always done this. Um, the people of Israel, it's like there's this, this constant like they, they don't learn and they go back to their evil ways, right? And so the main thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn from our history. <laughs> That's depressing. <laughs> and so um, here's, how, here's how that plays out. It's like there's this pendulum. My professor in Bible college used like a big figure eight, right? And so we'll, we'll start out well, and we're living a holy life, and we're serving God, and we're learning his word, and we're living according to his ways, and walking in a way that honors him. And then we don't, right? And we start to let things slide, and we start to do shady things. And not only that, we start to actually tolerate evil, and we normalize it, and then we give permission to it, and we start to justify it. And we start to get way over here, and we don't only really justify, we start to promote evil things. And we, we turn evil things into common practice and judge those who don't do it or accept it. And not only that, we eventually start to persecute those who do evil things and, and call things evil when they're, they're, we have come so far over here and gotten into crazy town that we... we say it's fine to do horrible things. Um, and I'll use one example, and I probably shouldn't use this, it's not politically correct, but sometimes it's not political, it's just evil, right? And so um, child sacrifice has been true for every single or, um, nation throughout history. And so, man, it, we call it abortion. And we ha have, and somehow, justified that we need to make legislation and, and policies to promote child sacrifice. Now, you guys say, Blake, you're, you're, you're crazy. I don't know. I'm just saying, calling it what it is. It's, this is biblical. It's like, this is history. It's happened over and over and over. We continue to get here. Now, do I have compassion for the debate of what it means to, you know, have someone that was uh, taken advantage of and the reasons why we, I, I, underst I understand that. And I, I know why we shouldn't. I have great compassion for women that have done that, and it hurt for, and I've ministered to in the midst of, of that. But at the same time, can I, can I call it what it is? Can I speak truth into, like, hey, we shouldn't promote things that are hurting the most vulnerable people in our society, right? Amen. Right? We should fight for them, especially, that's gotta be spoken here in the church. It's like, hold, 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 have we lost our minds? We're not crazy, are we? Like, we still have common sense, right? We have, we have no, what good and evil is. We, we know what good and evil is, and let's call it what it is. And so that's when people start getting way over here, and they're out of control that, that there's usually this call back to God. And people start going, hey, hold, hold on. There's way too much evil and darkness in this world, and we've got to turn back to things that are good and holy and true. The Bible says that it would be this way. Isaiah 5 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Right? So every single time that revival happens in the earth, it's usually when there's this desperation to get back to things that are, are good and true and holy, right? Because if you look at things that are evil, what do they look like? Disorder. There, there's dysfunction. There's hatred, anger, bitterness, slander, jealousy. It's crazy. There's chaos. My mom's here. Uh, you know what else it is? It's dirty. And my, my mom's taught me my whole life that cleanliness is next to godliness, right, mama? Yeah, amen, she said amen. So, so when there's order, it's clean. It's whole, it's pure. And so um, I'm preaching today. Um, every, every single time re revivals happened, it's when there's this repentance and desperation to say, I don't know how we got here, but let's change it. First, people turn back to God, and then there's this real hunger and desperation. We cry out, and we turn back to the goodness, the faithfulness, and the holiness of our Creator. So today, I'm calling this talk, Remember Your Roots. Remember Your Roots. Everybody say this out loud with me. Say, let us not forget. Let us not forget. Has anybody here ever um, lost their way? Anybody lost their way? 
Maybe you you got somewhere where you're like, man, <clears throat> I forgot who I am. I forgot where I came from. I forgot who I belong to. I forgot who I represent. Right? I got a family. I got a family. I got a tribe. I got a people that I represent, and I forgot. See, we have this tendency to do three things when it comes to remembering all that God's done in our lives. One, we forget. Two, we dismiss. And number three, we ignore. We forget, we dismiss, and we ignore. If you've ever been caught in any kind of addiction cycle and you've messed up, those three things are happening. You're forgetting what you were taught, the scriptures, the truth of the Bible, you're dismissing it and, and you're ignoring it. And so I don't want us to do that. I don't, I don't, instead of forgetting and dismissing and ignoring, I, I want us to talk about the good and the bad. I want us to remember and acknowledge what shaped us as, as a country and as a people and then to turn our affection and our attention and our focus towards the one that deserves all the glory and honor. I wanna worship him in the midst of, of my sin and say, hold up, we're not gonna go down that road anymore. We're gonna do a 180 and we're gonna get this thing back on track. See, the way that it happens with God is that we have to reach a breaking point. We have to get to the end of our rope and especially with our own sin, not just as a nation or let's not make it about a city, let's talk about ourselves, right? We have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired of Blake and the things that he's doing wrong. And once we've had enough and we're finally like sick of darkness and evil, uh, that's when we finally turn back to the creator and say, man, I'm sorry. I repent, I'm, I'm sorry. I cry out in desperation. And, and with this repentant heart, I say, you know what? I've, I've realized you are my only hope. How many here believe that for our city, for our nation, and for us individually, our only hope is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? <laughs> it's our only hope. And it comes down to one simple question. Who and what are you placing your trust in, right? Because if, if you're sitting in the room today and you're placing all your hope and trust in our economy, Lord Jesus, help you. If you're putting all your trust in our government and the leaders of our government, man, right? If you're placing your trust in your pastor, it's not good. We don't place our trust in men. It's never been about Greg Marksberry. It's never been about Doug Fultz, Shane Hargrave, or Blake Bergstrom. It's only, only about King Jesus and what he did on the cross. And that's who we're following. That's who we're trying to become like. And so, you know, remember John the Baptist. If people were following him, it's like, hey, you're, you missed it if you're following me. I'm fixing to have my head chopped off. <laughs> and you need to go find Jesus because he's helping people, you know, like, you know, the, the blind can see, the lame can walk. He's stopped the storm. You know, you should go follow that guy. <laughs> don't, don't follow this one. And so it's about where you place your trust. Jer Jeremiah said, blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It leaves, its leaves are always green. And it has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. That is such a beautiful verse. Uh, this week, my family planted a tree in my daughter's front yard. Um, and in that moment, when we were digging that hole, in order to get that tree to take root, what do you do? You have to put good soil in it, right? So we dumped a bunch of good soil in there. And then what do you do with the root ball? You have to open up all those roots, right? Yeah, you're doing it with me, Rebecca. You just like start to get it all loose and get those roots out. And then you surround that all by good soil, hoping that, right, with a bunch of water and saturating it with good nutrients, that those roots will get strong and firm, that they'll plant themselves into the ground and that it'll actually take root. Well, that's my prayer for each of you, individually. But it's also my prayer for us as a church collectively, that we would be connected by our roots, that we would be established, that we'd be strong and firm because I believe, 
I'm looking around at a whole bunch of good soil. And I'm seeing people that are bearing much fruit and doing great things in the midst of all of our challenges and struggles. Are we a perfect church? Nope. And if you are perfect, maybe you should consider a different church. Because <laughs> these people are jacked. We, we have our problems. Everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. But anything's with Jesus, anything's possible. And together, this body is a beautiful picture of what I think the church is supposed to look like. I mean, in fact, it reminds me of Colossians 2 where it says, let your roots grow down into what? Into him. And let your lives be built on what? On him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you'll overflow with thankfulness. Our mission here at One Church is to know God, grow deep, and go love. Evangelism, discipleship, and mission. And those are the three things that we're gonna be focused on for the rest of our time here. And so I, I need you to hear that. I, I think it's a beautiful picture. We talk about root system a lot. Uh, I think it's a beautiful picture uh, of a tree that I'm sort of obsessed with. And you guys would never geek out about a tree like I do. I'm a furniture builder and I love wood. And there's this one aspen tree that I'm just sort of like, I've gotta go there one day and see it. And so it's actually the largest living organism on the planet. You might have thought it was a whale, right? It's not, it's a tree. And so I went there just recently and I shot a video about that tree. Would you guys like to see it? Yes. Okay, watch this. You will not believe where I'm at right now. This is sort of like a moment for me. I'm kind of emotional because I am actually in the Pando Aspen clone here in Fish Lake National Park in the uh, south part of Utah. And the reason why this is significant to me is because I think God gives us pictures of what it looks like to have a community in the church in creation. And so he's done that by giving us the aspen tree. Now, here's what's cool. That, if you look at this landscape, that's one tree, one tree. And it, and it spans over 108 acres. Now, this tree weighs 6,000 tons, making it the largest living organism in the world. There's no bigger organism on the planet Earth. Isn't that amazing? And we're here right now. And the reason why, it clones itself. So here's what happens. Um, the root system is all connected. And so whenever you, um, the, the babies come up from the ground and they sprout. So um, what's beautiful is these are all the same exact tree and, and they actually are all cloned. Now, the reason why I think it's beautiful for the church is partly because um, whenever an old tree is dying, it, guess what it does? It sends all of its nutrients down into the ground to protect the new baby sprouts that are coming up. If there's any kind of a bug, a beetle, any kind of fire, guess what? The tree automatically sends it down into the root system because it knows that as long as it's connected by its roots, it still has its strength. And so for us at One Church, it, it's significant. I want us as a body to be rooted together, growing deep together, that we're disciples who are making disciples and that we're constantly focused on new growth that's coming from the ground. And so um, I, I just think it's so amazing to be in a place where God gives us a picture of what it looks like to really live in an amazing community. Isn't that awesome? Come on, now I'm gonna jump in the snow, you ready? <laughs> we ain't got snow like this in Georgia. <laughs> I like that guy. <laughs> He's such an idiot. Uh, that's my dream of what I want our church to look like, connected, where, where we realize, oh, wait, this isn't about an, you know, being an individual, isolated, disconnected, right? That's never the picture that God had for his church. What, what he had was a connected body that's vibrantly uh, spurring one another on, right? We're serving one another, that we recognize my, my life is for your life. My nutrients belong to you, right? Your problems, 
Come on, say it. They're my problems, right? We, we hold one another up and um, we, we help fight for those that are in the middle of a crisis, right? Like Brian Kaiser, that's, we're gonna love him through this whole season. And Woody, right? And I, I could go on and on for all, all the things that we're working through right now as a body. And your, your root system has to stay connected to each of us so that we're all growing together. And so I, I just wanna remember our roots. Are you guys with me? Yeah, remember our roots. For, it's a play on words, right? Not just where we came from, but currently our roots that are connected to one another. And so with that in mind, I'd like to look back at the past and what God's done through Greg Marksberry and Doug Fultz. Would you guys please welcome to them, them to the stage? Come on up. Yes. Stand up, church. Come on. Give an ovation for these men. I love you. Come on. Mm. So, um, I'm going to start by being a little sappy. Um, for, for me, you know, I'm younger than both of you. You're pretty ancient. And uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, what they did, our founding pastor uh, in faith, you know, as established, he was here 12 years, and Doug was here five years. Uh, so 25 years old together, the two of you represent 17 of those. And I'm four of them. So uh, it's, it's beautiful to see how God uses different people in different seasons. But for me in ministry, you guys have both seen this. A, a lot of guys have come and gone. And a lot of my dear friends have fallen to Im immorality, you know, scandals, or just sick of church, burnt out, and gave up. You guys have, you guys have felt those things. Because ministry is stinking hard. And uh, so I, I want to say, both of you are still serving the Lord. You're serving his church. You still give your lives. And I look up to both of you. I'm so thankful for your faithfulness to God all, all of these years. And I just want you to know how grateful I For me, it's super humbling for you to be here last night. We walked this property together. And to look at it through your eyes and what God's done through you and hear the story from you. It was so like beautiful. And so I, I just wanna I just wanna thank you. You guys, will you thank them for their faithfulness? For, yeah. So Greg, I'd like to start with you because I know you you uh, came here with the dream and a vision. It was like there there wasn't anything, right? You're just birthing this new baby church. And so what did God do to sort of like help you, you know? Get, to get this thing going. How, will you tell that story? Absolutely, Blake, and thank you for having us, and thank you guys for being here. And I, I, just to respond to what you've seen in ministry, mm. I thank God for how well you're loving this incredible pastor here to lift up his arms to keep going because God's doing something special mm. today in yeah, this place, yeah. and I thank God for what he's doing through you and through this church. And got to be part of watching God do something when he was getting it going. And when I came in, God had already been working upstream, actually. I don't know if you realize this, but you are a daughter church yeah. of Southwest Christian Church that at that point was in East Point, Georgia. Yeah. And, and Jimmy Donovan, the pastor there, had a vision after coming back from a mission trip to India to plant a church. And um, he said, we need to plant more trees, to use your analogy of that tree in your daughter's yard. And we need to this place needs a church. And so Southwest raised up this group of like 12 families. Dr. Biff was one of those. And um, 12 families were part of this and they started preparing them. It was like that sapling or that seedling, you know, they, they were preparing this tree. They wrapped the roots up. Dave Roadcup came in as a consultant to get them ready. And then they brought me along and said, we want, to, want you to go help dig this hole and put in the the dirt and help water and, and let help this this tree take root and that's the part of the process I got to be part of Blake and it was amazing to watch God do an incredible thing I tell people all the time new church work uh, I've never worked harder or had more fun yeah 
you know, than new church work and get to see what God did. He took those 12 families and in 10 years there are 1,200 people coming every week, you know, on Sunday through that 10 years. And it wasn't easy. There were a lot of, there's a credible faith that had to be exercised from that initial group stepping out to leave their home church, to, to be part of something new. And we went from Oak Grove Elementary School which at that time we considered the armpit of all the elementary schools in Peachtree <laughs> City. <laughs> That's where we got out of the gate to Braylon Elementary School, just because it was an older one. It was great people. And, and uh, Braylon from there, and then the Stars Mill, and, um, and then finally God opened the, the door to, to build on this property. And, you told me that story last night, and I was like, it, it just the way that you cried out to God and your faith in that, the way you, you know, held that rock. Would you, sh would you share that story? Yeah. It's beautiful. Well, it's such a, a defining moment, even in my ministry, and I, I can't wait to get you that rock. Come on, bring it. And, um, but yeah, so three and a half years in, people were tired of setting up and tearing down, and we started this land search, and a guy named Bob Arnold, wonderful older gentleman at that time, helped look, we stomped on all kinds of pieces of property, but, uh, they had done a demographic study. Jimmy Collins, who was uh, the president of Chick-fil-A at that time, had helped do a demographic study for the, the church. It said, this area right here was like ground zero, the best place for a church because of where all the growth was coming. And so this 77 acres became available, and we went and visited Mr. Brown, who lived right down the street, was on his deathbed at that time, wonderful man and wonderful family. And we talked with him, and he said, look, I would love to see a church there, but I shook John Whelan's hand uh, about a year ago. He was the largest builder in Atlanta at that time and said, I told him I'd get, let him buy the property. And so we, but, but he said, I'll consider it. We talked to him, he said, I'll consider selling you guys the property. And that, that uh, night, uh, knowing he was gonna make the decision, Mr. Brown, what to do, I came out to this property, it was like midnight, uh, you guys know what this is, right? So I could just see the visions, virgin piece of property, all pine trees. And I, I walked out onto the property and said, God, it's beautiful moonlit night through the Georgia pines. And I said, God, the, the potential here just seems like it's incredible. You know, like, would you just provide this for your people? And I started weeping and crying out and just praying, God, the, would you just make this spot like an epicenter for your for your ministry around this area and around the world and and uh, as I was crying I'd never done this before but I looked down there's a rock and I picked up that rock and I claimed it literally claimed this piece of property for for the, the Lord's church and and prayed and took that rock home took it to the office the next morning and that the next day we got a call from Mr. Brown and he said we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and sell the property to John Wheeland and I thought, oh, I put that rock in a, my credenza. You missed that, that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, okay. So I put the rock in my credenza desk drawer, and a year went by. A year later, we're still looking for property and praying. A year later, John Whelan's VP, a man named Dan, called us at the office. He said, hey, we heard you guys were interested in this property, this 77 acres. Are you still interested? I said, yeah. He said, well, let's sit down. Came to the table with our group of guys our leaders, and he, and, and he said, look, we would like to sell you guys the front 40 on the corner. We're gonna take the back 40 and build some exclusive homes around this lake, and we'll sell you the front 40 for $785,000. And one of the guys knew that they were buying the whole 77 acres for $75,000, and so he just mentioned it. Well, yeah, but well, you're buying the whole thing for 70, well, he goes, well, we gotta build some infrastructure. And, and as he's explained that, Dan stops. And he says, look, are you guys interested in all of it? And our guy says, yeah, well, we could be. He said, we'll just assign you the contract for the $785,000. We've already spent the money on soil testing and all that. We'll just assign you the contract. And, and that's where it began. The, the church was able to get this property, begin building, doing, <laughs> became the church home. And I took that, that rock in my credenza drawer, came out, went right back on the desk. And I was like, God, our God is a faithful right. God who provides in his time. <laughs> he has all the power to do what he wants to do for yeah. his people. Yeah. And uh, so it's been a, a, a testimony to me and to this whole church early on. Well, you're both the, you guys pray the same prayers me. 
God, would your power and presence show up, right? Would you, you, you've spent years praying for that same thing on this land, for these people in this city, right? And when I first moved here, this church was known for four things. N- number one is known for Awana, right? We have an amazing Awana program here. Number two, it was known for the academy, right? The academy was started by your wife, Ellie and Linda, and they did an amazing job. It's still going strong, 171 students, 30 teachers. It's on fire. Uh, number three, it was, it was you, Doug, that was saying, God, use this land. Let, let's start one of the best cross-country courses in Georgia. And to this day, like thousands of people every single year because of Don Livingston. Are you in the house, Don? <laughs> I wanna honor you as well. There you are, good looking. And so uh, God's used you and Doug together to build one of the, the top three courses in the state of Georgia, right, Be- because of your faith. So you've, you've moved a few rocks, just like this guy. Uh, and then the fourth one that everybody knew this church for was called Dickens Village. And a shout out for Dickens Village. We had uh, an amazing, amazing, like on Christmas, this place was a wonderland, right? And everybody tried their best accents and they were horrible at them, right? And I understand. So it was amazing outreach. Like 10,000 cars would come through every Christmas is what I heard. And so uh, Mike Stilley built that concrete pad out there. And there's just great men and women of faith that come, have come throughout the years to help this church make an, a, an amazing impact. Now, unfortunately, for a long time, this church wasn't known uh, for being a church. <laughs> it was known for a, a lot of things because we've been through a lot as a body. There's been a lot of hard things that we've walked through. But, you know, I, I do believe that storms, you know, it's like in training. Resistance training is what helps you grow the most. And the faithfulness of this body through a lot of the hard things has what's made us so strong. Because our roots, right, when it's dry, your roots go deeper. And um, so there's a lot of deep roots in this house. Uh, and it's because of the nutrients the two of you poured into these people for years, your faithfulness to disciple and baptize people. And so I, I can't thank you enough. But Greg, was there anything else you wanted to share with, with the body? Uh, you know, as a pastor, the, this is your, the, the way you described it to me, I thought it was so beautiful, the way you described like those years of heartache. Um, you know, it's like a, uh, a wayward child. You know, you, you birthed it and nobody, went, what, will you explain how you said that to me? I thought it was beautiful. I'm trying, I'm trying, to, um, trying to recall that in that moment. Yeah. But as I, as I think about the story here, I just think about God's faithfulness. Yeah. And through our season here, those first 12 years, we just had, it was incredibly hard work, but it was incredible fun and blessing. Yeah our life. You know, we raised our kids here and our youngest was born here and we made our best friends still to this day here. Yeah. And, um, I, I just, I think the season that would come and the storms that would come, and maybe this is what what you're thinking, the the storms in the season of drought that would follow. Um, the fact that God was able to sustain through faithful people, faithful work, his faithfulness to us, uh, the work here to this day, when you step back here and see this this tree that was planted, mm-hmm. just thriving and flourishing, providing shade mm-hmm. to this entire community beyond mm-hmm. to parts all around the world, Blake, it's incredible to see the power and faithfulness of God even through the droughts of life. Yeah. How he, when he plants a tree, he plants it to stay. That's right. And you guys have come along, and I'm so grateful he's led you here. That's the last piece I'd want to say. I praise God for, in his big plan, how he's worked through, through Doug and following, and then others, and then for this season that you're here, mm. to go to a whole new level of ministry and outreach. It's beautiful to see all these people. Mm. And I thank God for what he's doing right now today <laughs> in yeah. making this tree so fruitful. Yeah, yeah. Well... You, you planted it, and so uh, to see it alive and vibrant, it's just beautiful. And so my, my heart in having both of you is to honor you. That's it. I wanna honor you. I wanna thank you. Um, but Doug, 
the way that you came, came onto the scene and you, you had a lot of challenges that you were up against and the loyalty that you showed during those five years that you were here uh, and the faithfulness, uh, you know, you saw a lot of people give their life to Christ. Some of the most growth we had seen as a church was under your leadership. So there, there was stuff that was hard. There was also a lot of good. And so will you talk about your, your time while you were here, a part of this body? Yeah, and I just wanna say, Greg, you know, under your leadership, this church has such a great reputation oh, nationally. Yeah. And church planting church, and that's how I got to know Greg. Both, the, both Greg and I were involved in church planting, and so I knew Greg quite a while before I ever came here. I came here to a conference and was so impressed. Uh, but I know when, when you transitioned out, there was an undercurrent going on. And, and when I came here, the, the elders called it the perfect storm that had occurred. And part of it was the economy. I mean, you're talking 2008, 2009, the economy is just crashing. Mm -hmm. uh, Delta, which is such a huge part of Peachtree City, was, was you know, cutting back. And so it brought an economic, a further economic crisis. And then what was going on in the church, I don't know if you want to call it a split or an exodus, but there were a few hundred people that, that had left, eight of the top 10 givers. And uh, Greg had done such a great job in building these facilities and the church was moving forward and paying that off. But then when all of that happened, it, it, it that perfect storm. Yeah. And I think there's about a $9.6 million debt and we had, to, we had to come in and make some really hard decisions. Uh, it was pretty excruciating, you know. Um, but uh, well, you were top heavy as a staff at the time. There's a lot of, a lot of staff. So, so you had to go in. It, but, but, you know, we, we knew we needed to pay down the debt. And so mm -hmm. we, we did this program called Let No Debt Remain, mm -hmm. which the idea was at the end of the program, there would be no more debt, which I look back on that and I thought, that was a bit optimistic, maybe, you know, <laughs> thinking about that kind of debt. But we went through that, and, you know, we were able to get it down to about, uh, I don't know, we, we paid off about $2.5 million dollars in debt. Yeah. But there was now, an, hold on. I, I yeah. know that that was a massive burden for you. God placed that on your heart, and yeah. you were out here on this property, like, walking around, not, not eating <laughs> and praying and, like, fasting, and I think you were naked. And, uh, <laughs> Almost. <laughs> My clothes were falling off of me, that's for sure. Mike, St Mike Steely felt so bad for me, he bought me a whole new wardrobe that oh. I can't wear anymore. As you see, I'm not into fasting anymore, so I'm into fast food. <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of what's going on these days. But yeah, you know, and I felt called to, to do that 40-day fast. And, yeah. and um, you, you know, God's faithful. And uh, uh, when, we, when we ended up, I just want to tell you one story. Uh, we got down to the point where we didn't have any reserves. Uh, Sam Morris, I, I remember, was, was working with finance. And after we paid our mortgage, that we were paying every week, about $16,000, 17000 every Monday. Yeah. And uh, we paid all that off, and we had less than $100 left in our bank account. And we had payroll coming up at the end of the week. And they needed $6,500. And Sam says that the, their group began to pray that God oh, would I bring. Oh, I can hear Sam. Sam's like, yeah, the, Sam's the Lord, here. Lord always provides in the 11th hour, Pastor Blake. It's going to be fine. <laughs> I've heard the same thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and they were praying, God, would you bring $6,500? I mean, there yeah. were no offerings coming in, yeah. you know? Yeah. And while they were praying, there was a knock at the door. They opened the door, and it was Mike Schistler, former elder here. Mike has gone on to be with the Lord. And he was a Chick-fil-A executive, and he had been traveling. He says, I've been out of town. I brought my tithe check. How much do you think it was? $6,500. That's <laughs> beautiful. And, uh, Come on. That's amazing. You know, God just sent a message that, you know, he was not going to let yeah. what was planted die. Yeah. God was in this. That's right. And that was so encouraging to all of us. And, uh, you know, when I, had, when, I, when I ended up transitioning out, there was still quite a bit of debt. And I was a little confused by that, I'll be honest with you, because I thought God had called me here to help pay that debt down and get yeah. rid of that debt. And, and so when I went on to work with the Solomon Foundation, I learned about a program. 
that would help churches get out of that debt and to really get healthy again. And so I remember coming and talking to Blake about it and the elders, and we were able to, well, no debt remains, right? And so uh, yeah, yeah. it worked out okay. Yeah. So I, a lot of you are here for the first time today. I met some of you. You're like, had never heard this story. So we actually have this you know, amazing uh, bridge that God built uh, between Doug and this church where a guy was saying, I'm gonna help you get out of debt. He goes to the Solomon Foundation, and he, and he did. God answers prayers. Sometimes it's just not like you would think, right? He does it in a completely different way. And so we gave them our property, and now we lease from the Solomon Foundation. Uh, our, our mortgage was 63000 a month. We had been paying interest only of 33000 and we couldn't pay that. And so he comes and says, we'd like to buy your property. And they invested $2.2 million into this property to build out the upper room and get, you know, revitalize this, all of it, the, the parking lot, all the buildings, the HVAC. Um, it, it's beautiful because of their investment into us. And now our lease payment is only $25,000 a month. So it's, it's like, I'm not, I'm in the people business. I'm not in real estate, right? Like, of course we'll do that. It was like this beautiful um, option for us that literally we would not be here. We were gonna close the doors uh, when we first came. And so now to see us not only uh, surviving, but as you like to say, thriving, he, he, he runs a church called Thrive Church. So that's a good plan on words. But um, to, to, to see us come, come to life because of you, Doug, God did answer your prayers. And so thank you for coming in seasons of drought where it was dry and harsh and hard conditions. And, and now God has, you know, brought it back to life and it's colorful and green again, you know, and beautiful. So um, Doug, is there anything else, you know, you were a pastor here. Is there anything, you, any pastoring you'd like to do to these, with these folks? And, yeah. Well, we loved our years here. And... Um, you know, the Bible says God knows the end from the beginning, from yeah. ancient days, what is yet to come. And, you know, there were days when this room wasn't nearly as full as it is today. But God saw today, and he sees tomorrow, and he sees where this church is headed. And we're so excited to be a part of it, you know, as a part of the Solomon Foundation. We're just thrilled with the leadership that Blake has brought and the vision. And uh, God's going to continue to do amazing things through this church. Mm, amen, amen. Well, something that I wanna um, do real fast, this is about honor today. And so I'd like to ask anybody that um, was a, a founding member, you were here at the very beginning, we'd like to honor you, and I'd like to ask you to stand if you're, if you're in the room. Anybody that was a founding member in this, hey, hey, yeah, come on. Come on. There you are. Amazing. Amazing. I'd like to ask anybody that was 20 years or more a part of this body and you weathered all of those storms together, 20 years or more, would you stand? Come on. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Man. Uh, anybody that's 10 years or more and you, you've gone through a lot as well. Would you stand? Yeah, look at that. Yeah, amazing. All right, all right. Some of you new folks, five years or more, let's represent, come on. Five years or more, yeah. All right. Okay. If you've started attending in the past year, would you stand? in the past year or two, and yeah, yeah. Hey, come on. Okay, I'm gonna make a declaration. We believe that we are just getting started and the best is yet to come. Do you guys believe that? Yeah. Um, I, still, I still wanna honor some people real fast. I'm sorry, you took the lights down. I wasn't ready. Um, I, I'd like to honor any previous staff members that have served here. Is there any previous staff that were on staff here? There we go. Yeah. Is Paul Cole in the house? Where's Paul? He was doing the, the he was hosting today. 
He's outside. Of course, he's serving somewhere. Um, I'd like to have um, our current elders, our current elders to all stand in the house. Where's our current elders? Yeah, there you are. Yeah. These men here, these men have believed in Blake more than Blake's believed in Blake. And you've helped shape me. And I, these are my knight in shining armor to sit around the circle with me. And they help me grow day in and day out. I'm so grateful for you. Uh, I'd also like to ask all the other previous elders that have been a part of this body throughout the years, would you also stand? All the elders. Yeah, there's, there's a few of you. Yeah. Come on, come on, come on. So um, I'd like to close today. Thank you. The lights can come back down. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to close today by saying a blessing over you, and then we can pray and be done. Um, you know, when, when Paul launched a baby church like you in, in the city of Ephesus, there's this beautiful prayer that he spoke over them and prayed over them that's found in um, Ephesians 3 that I think is the perfect way to close out this time together. He spoke these words. He said, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, just like Marsha was yesterday, to be filled to overflowing with the knowledge and the measure of the fullness of God. How beautiful is that? And with the idea that we believe that we're just getting started and the best is yet to come, he says this, now to him. <laughs> I'm sorry, Greg. I mean, cry in front of you. Uh, you guys are a part of this. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. <laughs> Who he might have to finish for. <laughs> to him be the glory in the church <laughs> and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Will you guys give them a hand? Thank you so much for coming. Let me close this in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for doing more than we could have ever dreamed or imagined. <laughs> and we're just getting started. Oh, great God. We need you. We cry out to you. We thank you for all the baptisms, lives that are being changed. <laughs> we cry out to you in desperation, God. We ask for revival. We thank you for sending revival. We pray, Father, that you'd forgive us of our sins, that you'd wash us clean. And we pray, Father, that we would be faithful, and that we'd be disciples who make disciples, that we'd be hungry for your word, God, and that your word would help us stay rooted. And we will remember those roots today. We will remember uh, all the things you've taught us and remember all the things that you've done. And today, we give you every ounce of the glory and the credit and the honor. It all belongs to you forever and ever and ever. And so, Father, we worship you from the depths of our being. We give you every ounce of the credit. And today we want to praise you. We want to, we want to thank you. And we want to say to you that we love you with 
all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen.